Good morning, LTWC family, friends, and guests. My name is Sequoia, and these are your Sunday morning announcements. If this is your first time worshiping with us, welcome. Now, do me a favor, text LTWC to the number below, and someone from our connection team will reach out to you. If you're in person, there is a QR code that's on the back of your seat. Go ahead and scan it. Or you can stop by our connection table that's in the lobby and someone will be there to greet you and get you caught up on all things of LTWC. Again, we say welcome and we are so excited to have you worshiping with us this morning. Studying the word of God is the heart of who we are at LTWC. Small group Bible study helps us learn about God together in a safe, judgment-free environment. When we study together, we build relationships and deepen our faith. Bible study is transformational, and we want you to be a part. Please note, due to Valentine's Day, Bible study will not take place this coming Wednesday, February the 14th, but will resume on Wednesday, February the 21st. And remember, registration is open in the Church Center app, so let's make it a great semester. Hey, LTWC, have you heard? We're moving to not one, two, but three services. Starting soon, we'll add a third service to the lineup beginning Sunday, March the 3rd. Get ready to experience another level of convenience and available seating, starting right at early at 8 a.m. That's right, LTWC. We have the seats. <laughs> And we have parking too. Yeah, we saw you circling the parking lot trying to get a closer spot. Whether you're looking to kickstart your morning with God's word, or you need to finish grocery shopping earlier, this service has got you covered. The 8 a.m. service will have everything, minus childcare. Sorry folks, no Kingdom Kids will be offered at the 8 a.m. service, but no worries. Child care will be offered at our other two services, which the new start times are 9.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. So there you have it, folks. Three incredible services launching on March the 3rd at 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m., and 11.30 a.m. See you at our new service times and keep watch on your social media for updates. All right, everyone, again, this is Sequoia coming to you with your Sunday morning announcements. I pray you each have an amazing week. Now, let's get ready for a wonderful word from our pastor. Peace and blessings. Let's give God a hand of praise. Amen. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Could you stand all over the house one more time? I know you have sat down and you have gotten well, west, well rested. Could you find two or three people and tell them our God is more than able? And good morning. And good morning. And good morning. And good morning. And good morning, and good morning again. And good morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I welcome our online audience. Thank you for being with us this morning as well. As God is doing a great thing in our presence, I'm thankful, very thankful, that you were the invited guest and you're here today. Uh, that's as much as we're going to do so you can rest assured that you are in good, safe space, and prayerfully you are comfortable. You have been greeted well, treated well, loved on well. In addition to that, I would like to thank God for um, the propagators, the 
uh, the, the, the uh, prophetic voices that helped us to really bring home the Bounce Back is Real series in the person of Pastor Mon and Elder Mercer. Amen. Thank you all so much. It was great hearing such an edifying message for myself, but also for the body of Christ. Thank you all for handling that. Let's give them another round. Amen. And I'm so grateful that God doesn't just give us good help. He gives us God help. Hallelujah. Again, you hear about the two services. We're getting ourselves prepped. Uh, so I've decided to start parking on the highway and walking up to the church. <laughs> making sure that I am getting my Fitbit steps in. <laughs> so if you see my car with hazard lights on, it's okay. It's okay. I'll be there when service is over. Um, uh, yesterday I put in 42 miles on the bike we're getting our long capacity ready for these three services but that is just us trusting God with the resources we have our, our next move is to go into phase two of our building project and we're thankful to God for that we're keeping it a little bit nondescript right now because we're going through the very meticulous prayerful and professional stages in order to make sure that we're able to do it effectively, efficiently, and of course, to the glory of God. And so you'll be hearing more as time goes on. Our consultant will um, actually be meeting with us the second time this week to lay out a plan. And again, thank you for your prayers in advance of that. We're grateful for our G1 course, which kicked off its second installment yesterday. 85 of you showed up. We want to let you all know that what we're doing is building a leadership profile for future leaders in our church. And G1 helps us to establish culture. Culture will eat strategy for breakfast all day long. So we want to make certain that we have the right culture in our church so that we can move full steam ahead and be a church of legacy and not, of a, church, not a church of let down. And so that's a part of us when you say, well, how can I lead? Or if you're ready for leadership, well, we're building that profile. So for those of you who missed the second installment but signed up and was present for the first installment, I'm here to tell you, don't stop, get it, get it. In other words, keep going because we want you to be a part of what God is doing in our house. Um, last but not least, uh, with Grateful Bible Study has kicked off. Man, over 300 people were on campus on Wednesday night. Amen. Thanks to my lovely wife and her wonderful work and you all trusting us and leading this discipleship hub of our church. Thank you so much for that. And I appreciate all of you for your support and everything that we are able to put our hearts around, hands around, and spit around. Um, today we kick off a new series, as you have seen, concerning spiritual warfare. Thank God. Uh, my sermon has been done because it's good to be able to bask in what God is doing and to really trust what God is saying. And so uh, a lot of this that we're going to hear is a week old but fresh to you. Amen. And the reason I say that is because it's important for us to understand God speaks prophetically to the house when the house is open to the prophetic voice of God. So today we're going to be talking from the title in the fight of my life. Could you tell your neighbor if you only knew? you only knew what I had to go through, what I've been going through, if you only knew the fight that was in front of me. Over the next three weeks, we will be delving into the powerful words of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. In this particular passage, Paul encourages us to put on the full armor of God in order to stand strong against the schemes and the schematics of the devil. We will deal with the armor of God in specific terms in the second installment of three installments of this series. Today, my job and throughout this series is to lay foundation and build on each concept to help us go further into our spiritual reality. Uh, for example, on next week, we're going to be talking about the three dimensions of warfare. So prepare for that as well. Today, we're going to dive into this necessary topic and pull from Ephesians, the sixth chapter. And I'm going to be coming from the entirety of the thought without going into all of the detail. But for the first three verses, that will suffice us today. When you see it, Ephesians 6, 10 through verse number 12. Say amen. amen. Can you read it with me? A final word. 
Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Can I pause you for a moment? Um, the devil doesn't appear in your life in a red tidy suit <laughs> and a pitchfork. He is not poked to guys and he is not turning heads 360 degrees to prove to you he is present. Notice the text says that he has strategies. The enemy is a strategist. He is a very smart, brilliant personality. He does not make himself known. He is um, a strategic. He is methodical. He sets you up for the get up. He doesn't just hit you in one area. He don't just come at you face forward, but he flanks you. He doesn't just hit you. He hits your children. He doesn't just hit your children. He hits your bank account. He comes in a multiplicity of ways. And can I tell you further, he also comes to church. We used to think that the devil was immune to church, but he's, number, he's the number one attender to church. He got a Bible bigger than your Bible, and he comes to church. He knows every song. He knows every quotation of spiritual Christianese. He, is, uh, uh, he knows the language of church. He loves to come into the dwelling house of God because he knows the house of God is the only institution that has been equipped to deal with him in the way of dominance. And so he comes to church. He wears suits and ties and dresses from Carol Little. He has Gucci and Balenciaga, and he has eyelashes on. Amen. <laughs> He has, amen, amen, muscle shirt on, amen, eyelashes that'll fly you away, amen. Even singing the songs, I'll fly away on that glad morning, I'll fly away, right? And so the enemy does not come in in the strategy of, a per, of what I'll call of, of, of being a parent. He makes himself clothes. He doesn't, he wears uh, uh, the clothing of leadership. He wears the clothing of leadership. Now we pick up with me in verse 12, for we are not, let's so we'll go, now go, one, two, three, go. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. I want you to catch note of verse 12. It says the enemy wants promotion. He's not a low-level devil. He is not one who is chasing people to cemeteries and scaring them. Notice the text, it says, but against rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. The enemy is always strategically positioning himself as a power center. He's, ever since he's got evicted from heaven, when he tried to have an insurrection, he's been trying to ascend back to the position he got evicted from. And so today's talk is going to be a foundational talk. And let me give you a little backdrop to this context of the book of Ephesians. Paul writes this letter to the Ephesian church as he was in prison in Rome. The city of Ephesus from which we get the book of Ephesians was a bustling and diverse metropolis with a mix of Greek and Roman and Jewish influences. It was a major center for worship of the goddess Artemis. It was a spiritually dark and challenging place for early Christians. Lots of sorcery, if you read in the book of Acts, where the actual emanation of Ephesian or the church of Ephesians is birthed from, they had a lot of sorcery and divinators and occult practices in the context of this nation called Ephesus. There in the city of Ephesus, from which we get the book of Ephesians, Paul was endowed to perform special miracles because the enemy cannot duplicate all the special miracles of God. So God gave him special miracles because God had to make a delineation, a distinction between true miracles from God and false occultic miracles from Satan. If you recall, there was in Ephesus this Jewish exorcist uh, known as the seven men of Sceva. Uh, they pop up on the scene and they decide they're going to cast a demon out of this particular person. And they go up to this demon-possessed person and say, I cast you out in the name of Jesus whom Paul knows. Well, let's cut across the field. The story is told that when they got through making their preamble and making themselves known to this demon-possessed boy, this boy beat them up and gave them the molly whopping of their life. 
All seven of them left naked and bludgeoned and beat down. They had to go to the police station and file a domestic violence report. Because you cannot cast out what you don't have authority over. And I don't care how you call on Jesus, are you under the authority of Jesus? That's a lot of folk, false flagging. They carry the cross of Christ without being uh, daily dying to Christ. And they think they have power, but they haven't surrendered to the will of God. And so, my brothers and sisters, there were many who were in Ephesus, the Bible says, who practiced magic. Not magic that didn't work either. These magicians, these occult leaders, these people who were practicing this stuff had control of an entire nation to the point that when Paul pops up in Ephesus, he turns what was an ecosystem of sorcery on its head because that's what apostles do. They don't just come into environments because they have a title, but apostles are those who come into an environment and makes it right with God. Their job is to overturn authority structures that hinder the flow of God to a city, to a place, to a person. They're not just those who have an internet title, an entourage, 20 people that follow them, but five members in their church. They're not those who walk around talking about sons and daughters. I'm so tired of y'all Christian widows talking about that's my son, that's my daughter. Go have some children. I'm a grown man. I don't need another father. My father is a good man. I don't need you to have a bunch of daughters because that's complicated within itself. I ain't scared. I'm just saying. So we have these, these weirdo apostles popping up who are looking for title, adulation, accolation, attention. They're looking for a personal aggrandizement. They're looking for a void to be filled because they miss having attention as a child. But apostleship in its true form comes into an environment and turns Satan upside down. And turns the kingdom right side up. So when you say, oh, God called me to the apostleship, then your warfare will be like never before. Don't go somewhere you ain't been assigned because the enemy will run you out of that territory if you have not been endowed by God. I will finish. I will finish. The Bible says they burned their magic books. The word of the Lord grew powerfully and spread. Paul's words on spiritual warfare and the armor of God would have been a timely message of those who were in Ephesians as they are a timely message for us. The spiritual, they were spiritually curious but lacked the necessary tools to contend with the cultural trend of experimentation that led them to implore, that, led, that leads rather me to implore to you that we should not be so enamored with warfare that you get spooky and religiously judgmental of others. At the same time, don't dismiss the concept that you get lured, that you can get lured into a battle by the enemy and lose. In verse 12, 10 through 12, Paul outlines three responsibilities of the believer for which I'm going to jump into. The first one, he makes it clear that you ought to be strong where? In the Lord. Be strong. Which means you need to be intentional uh, about your personal discipleship. You need to understand that you cannot defeat the enemy in your own strength. And some of y'all understand warfare, and we'll talk more about that. But we cannot defeat the enemy in our human strength. But we have to rely on the power of God. That's what Paul said. Don't be strong in your intellect. Don't be strong in your decision making. Don't be strong in your looks. Don't be strong in your last name. Don't be strong in your gifting. Be strong in the Lord. He says, in other words, in order to defeat this enemy in your life, you've got to be so surrendered that you can't even utter the words that you did anything. Because the strength will be totally attributed to the God who gave you all that you need at a time you had no one else to give it to you. Uh, my brothers and sisters, which means we got to make sure that we're not just coming to church once a week, amen. We can't read our Bible just when we're in trouble. We can't just pray when we need $5,000 deposited into our bank account. But we need to have a lifestyle of prayer and a lifestyle of reading the Word and a lifestyle. Our worship should not stop when success increases. Amen. As a matter of fact, for every level, there's a devil. And when I go up, I got to even be more in the word because the enemy at that level is different than the enemy at the prior level. I got to be strong, which means I got to surrender more of my time to the kingdom of God and to God. I can't just 
pray once a week. In fact, prayer is not a formality. Prayer is a conversation. You can't just pray when church is going on. You got to pray when you're going to work. When you're ready to go in and set it off, you got to go in saying, God, they about to catch hands, but I'm praying today. They about to catch, I'm about to catch a case, but God, I thank you for peace that passes all understanding. They didn't mess with my child at that school, God. This going to be the last day. If you don't intervene, somebody go find me on the news. <laughs> my brothers and sisters, I will tell you that your weakness is your strength. Your weakness is your strength. The Bible says very clearly our weakness is made strong. In Christ Jesus. So whatever you struggled with, whatever you fought, when you surrender and submit to God, he'll give you strength in that area. See, the enemy has disqualified some of you all because of a past. But when you're strong in the Lord, what you're strong is, is in his grace, his power, his testimony. Not you. You don't have to be perfect to say, God, I want to be strong. All you have to do is surrender and God will give you supernatural strength. We're reminded of that in Philippians, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We're reminded of that in Isaiah, that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wiggles. They shall what? Walk and not faint. Run and not be weary. Why? Because I have waited on God. I'm not walking in my strength, not by power, not by might, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. The first thing we need to do is we need to be strong. The second thing the believer has to do is to put on. It says put on the full armor of God. Amen. A half-dressed Christian is waiting for, waiting for defeat. Put on. No one else will dress you. No one else will dress you. It's kind of weird to have a bunch of people dressing you as an adult. God says you got to put on the full armor of God. Who has to do it? Yourself. You have to be intentional about putting on every ounce of weaponry yourself. You can't wait on the church to put on every armor. You can't wait on the pastor to put on every piece of armor. You got to wake up every morning and you got to dress yourself right. You got to say, I'm putting on the helmet of salvation because I know who I am. I'm putting on, I'm putting on the breastplate of righteousness because I'm protected from the darts of the devil. I'm putting about the, my loins girt about with truth because I won't let my warfare or my my armory dropped because I'm in battle and I'm carrying the sword of the spirit because I won't let the enemy influence infect or in any way contaminate the seed of faith in my life put on put on you know uh, back in the day you know there were dresses that ladies would wear and uh, they would get up to a certain point and they would wait on somebody maybe a husband or a spouse or someone in the house to come zip up the rest of the dress and, 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 and that was just normal place and, and here's the deal um, um, the truth of the matter is there ain't nobody here to finish that last part to zip up you got to put on the full armor of God yourself and brothers and sisters, when we talk about the armory of God, uh, most of us would understand it from the concept of what it means to dress right. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, most of us who are here, we understand color coordination and patterns and, and we understand fabrics and we match things up. But, you know, uh, I, most of us uh, had to dress our children. Let's just say it that way for those of you who have children or those of you who got nieces and nephews. You know, you dress them and they come out the uh, room looking good because you done laid the whole outfit out from the shirt down to the socks to the shoes. You done laid it out. And then after a certain time as a parent, you just get tired. You're like, I ain't dressing you no more. I didn't bought all them clothes. You figure it out, right? Anybody been there? I'm there right now. You figure it out. <laughs> figure it out. You know, you want to wear a Reebok with Nike and Adidas and Under Armour? That's on you. I'm no longer making you synchronized. <laughs> you want to come out the house looking raggedy? Okay, they ain't going to say nothing to me. You got clothes. You just choose not to coordinate. And, you know, I didn't, take, I didn't take clothing coordination serious because, you know, that's what my mom would do. And one day she got tired. And so she told me, um, you know, you just figure out. You got clothes in that drawer. You figure it out. And I didn't have no concept of style. I remember just getting ready for school, man. And I don't know about y'all, but when I was born and raised and how I came through school, they would jone you to death. 
it was a hazing of hazing. It, it, was, it, was getting through, it was getting through some stuff. And so I remember just going to school. My mom was like, that's what you're wearing? I said, yeah, I'm good. I'm comfortable. So I get into school. And I'll never forget, I had on some high waters. And, man, I walked in class. And one of the, I remember this joke to this day. But he said, man, you need to call a meeting between your ankles and your feet. <laughs> Told me up, man. Had me embarrassed. And they didn't just do it for one class hour. They did it for eight hours. All day, and you didn't get out of it until the next week. I mean, at lunchtime, ah, that go high waters, right? He flood. Now he ain't flooding today, but he's flooding Monday, and that helped me to understand I'm going to get serious about dressing. And maybe some of you all need to be embarrassed before you all take being spiritually geared up with the right clothes on. Before you all say, "I'm putting on the right armor this time." The last thing he tells the believer you're responsible for is you got to be aware. You got to be aware. Be aware. Uh, the, verse 12 puts it this way. For we're not fighting against uh, flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. This reminds us that we can't walk around thinking all conversations are godly, all people are godly, or that all circles are healthy. You need spiritual discernment like never before. You need spiritual radar that's not judgmental, but it guards you. In fact, my brothers and sisters, it's in the house of God that you need more discernment. I know what those outside the house of God believe. I can spot them from a mile away. What did David say? He says, if it was an enemy, I would have understood that. But it was the one I took sweet communion with as we went to the house of God. It's in the house you need discernment. It's in the house. In the house, you need to have a radar that allows you not to be judgmental, but it guards you from being bamboozled, hoodwinked, and fooled. Satan, Satan employs other humans and their personal demons as tools to influence, provoke, deter, distract, and manipulate you. This is one of his many pathetic but effective tactics is that he gets folk who look like you. He gets folk who showed up at the same entrepreneurial consortium with you, thinking y'all on the same page, and he uses your goodness through someone, and he will expose you by having you give them trust. And, you know, I read something, man, and it blew me away. It blew me away. It messed me up. The problem with most of us is that um, people don't love us like we love them. You, you, you ain't been hurt. You just ain't learned how to love with discernment. Yeah, yeah, I know it hurt after the fact, but you, you open yourself up to because you thought because we was in the same place and we was in the same Panera Bread and we was at the same Starbucks and we like the same caramel macchiato or we like the same matcha green tea with oat milk because we have similar interests and tastes that we are on the same page and you got to discern. In fact, give folk a side eye for a long time. Just stare. What you staring at? That demon on your shoulder? Because I've learned the closer you are to a breakthrough, the more desperate Satan becomes. And some of y'all know what it feels like. You have had hell step on your doorstep, take a picture of its package at your door, sent you an email and said hell is at your door. Be aware that he might use anybody. To divert you from your path, a close friend, a relative, anybody, your own ego, your own ego. He will use fellow church members. He don't care who he uses to destroy your momentum and purpose. First Peter reminds us, he says, be alert and sober minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. The problem with some of us is that we've been playing patty cake with the devil. Patty cake, patty cake, bake the cake, bake the cake, whatever else to say. <laughs> and the enemy lures us in through negotiated compromise. And he tells you how fun it was. He partners with you with verbal affirmations as though you got away with it. 
as though it won't come back to you because somehow, how could God be against a good time? Why y'all so quiet? And the more he gets your defenses down, believing he is a co-signer and a partner of this season, he pulls you in and destroys you one piece at a time. And the best way to put it is this, this great paper, he'll pull you in and just rip you apart. Because his whole job is to kill, steal, destroy, so that what was doesn't exist anymore. And brothers and sisters, here's the one truth you need to know. We are in a spiritual battle. Can I even say to those who are here, we're not on a cruise ship. We're on a battleship. This ain't Norwegian uh, cruise lines. This isn't Carnival cruise lines. This isn't Royal Caribbean cruise lines. And y'all got fans that you don't use the American versions anymore. You fly to France and get a whole new cruise line. You go Hilton cruise line. You so big, bad, and bougie now. But whatever it is, this thing called faith in God and relationship with Jesus is a battleground. Peter cautions the believers to be watchful and alert. He tells them the enemy seeks to devour us. He says in James, submit to God, resist the devil. In 2 Corinthians, he says our weapons are spiritual, not physical. He says over and over again that we need to have discernment. We need to be able to see what's going on without having to see it just in the natural before we understand it was demonic. So today, I want to talk to you about three errors, errors of spiritual attack. In, in my studies for this series, God gave me the revelation of three errors, times or epochs, periods of time in which everybody uh, and soon-to-be believers come under severe attack, three particular times. And so anytime God is about to birth something, the enemy is there to either deform it or to destroy it. His job is to deform or to destroy what's about to be birthed. Now, with that being said, the first era of which the enemy attacked you and came under heavy since you were a child. Since you were a child. Um, the enemy did not wait till you got in a full-grown adult. He didn't wait until you got a beard. He did not wait until you came into your first foreign car. The enemy has been after you since you were a child. And brothers and sisters, y'all remember the story where the father brings his child to Jesus. The Bible says that this particular child was demon-possessed and the spirit in him, the, the demonic spirit in him, would throw him into the fire and throw him into the water with the intent to destroy him. The father is at this point at his wit's end. He has no more therapy sessions left on his insurance. He has no more PTO days left with his job. He has no more cousins and relatives and uncles. He can drop his boy off who will tolerate his spasmodic attitude. He is at his wit's end. He hears about Jesus and brings his boy to Jesus. Notice the conversation. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has this been with him? What's the answer? What does a child got to do to be demon possessed? Why would a demon want to be fully possessed or fully in the life of and possessed, uh, possessed rather, a boy? Hmm. Because when the enemy understands that you have been birthed with a purpose, the thing he wants to do is to stop you before you ever come into full awareness. All right, okay. Notice what he says. I'll come back to that. It often throws him into the fire or into the water, trying to patty cake with him. That ain't what it says. Trying to kill. Can, can I be honest with y'all? And you ain't going to like this announcement because it's going to expose the fact that you've been called since birth. The devil been trying to kill you for a long time. Yes. Yes, and he's been wanting you to give up for a long time. And he comes at us in a way that we have been birthed in families that you were called to be the answer to family dysfunction. 
And I'm going to just be honest with y'all. Y'all don't like it. You've been trying to run away from your family lineage, and you can't get away from it. I don't care how sophisticated, how successful you are. I don't care how far you have moved away. Somehow the drummer still finds your phone number. <laughs> Somehow you're the one that's always bailing them out with $200 and $300. And you're the one that they always call to get them. And you got to travel here and travel there. And you found yourself. And you're like, I can't wait to get away from them. And God says, I'll never call you to get away. I inserted you in dysfunction so you can correct it for generations to come. Now, here's the thing. The enemy is targeting uh, this child, right? He's targeting this child, and he hits us in stages of our life that we are most vulnerable, and he tries to exploit our vulnerabilities. And this boy being possessed, he was coming after this young boy because he wanted to hit him in his formative years, attacking his mind, his emotions, his self-esteem. And I have never seen a day and time where our children are the most well taken care of children in generations. They got a PS4, a PS5, a PS6, a PS7, an Xbox, a Nintendo Switch. They were believers. Balenciaga, amen. They were McQueen. They, they, amen, amen, amen. They got lashes that'll help them fly away, amen. They are balling out, amen. They got, they got red bottoms now. They got, they got Gucci and all kinds of stuff. And yet they are the most tormented generation <laughs> mentally because the enemy is trying to get your child to walk into suicidal ideation. He is destroying our children. They got 59 inch TVs in their bedroom. Man, I would have a 13 inch and pray to God that it was color. And here's the deal. Our kids got all kinds of access. They got an iPhone 9, 10, 12, 13, 19, 18. They got that thing called Droid. What is it? Android, Droid and. They got one of them, anti-theft deterrence, right? They got that in their possession, right? And they got their old stuff. But yet they're the most attacked generation. And brothers and sisters there coming out of their rooms telling you they're good and they're hungry but they're dying. Y'all gotta, y'all gotta quit, y'all gotta quit outsourcing parenthood to possessions. I bought you, don't matter. They need you to be the spiritual thermostat of their destiny. They need you to sense, see, and feel without them ever knowing or saying what's going on in their mind. Amen. My mama used to do me like that, man. My mama would come out of prayer and she would come in our room. I mean, poof. You're like, what's going on, mama? I just got out of prayer. Something ain't right in this room. I'm not lying, y'all. I'm serious. I would be sitting there like, surely she don't know. We just hid it in the drawer. And she would go over there by the drawer like something over here. And then she would give us an opportunity. She said, either you can tell me about it or I'm going to find out. Of course, I'm not going to tell about it. Snitches get stitches. And, I, and, and without fail, she would find whatever shouldn't have been in that house. And boy, I don't know about y'all, but boy, we got whoopings. My God, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I remember it. I remember that I have some, <laughs> I got some PTSD. I just had thought when I was dodging them switches. <laughs> Whoever thought we'd have to go and get our own punishment off a tree. <laughs> and they would examine them. And these are good switches. I would look for the brittle ones, the small ones. They would examine them switches like, yeah, this is good. But they did not allow our lives to um, uh, separately exist in the same house. They didn't let our, just because they were in the room and in the house, now with the access of technology, our children are being exposed to cyberbullying. They've been exposed to all kinds of stuff. And we've got to get in our mind that our children are under attack. Y'all thought he was just after you, but he was after your seed. And brothers and sisters, then the enemy's goal is to ultimately weaken our faith when? Since a child. Since a child. Notice what the father's declaration is when he comes to Jesus. He says, help my unbelief. Which means the father started losing hope in the fact that his son could ever be normal. 
which meant the son was going to follow the faith path of the, of the father, and he was starting to lose hope that he would ever be normal. See, the enemy is trying to, he's trying to, um, here's the word, he's trying to retard your faith. He wants you to have kind of enough faith to acknowledge God, but not enough faith to believe God. Can we just say to the enemy, I still believe God. And so here is your response to this scenario of attack since you were a child. Forgive yourself, please, and pray. Forgive yourself. Why? Because there were some things that you didn't know and you were not privy to and you participated in and not realize you were under spiritual attack. And the enemy tried to get you so uh, deformed in your identity that you, would, you thought you were just having a good time and you thought you were just having innocent fun, but that thing is still with you in your 30s. And you need to forgive yourself. Some of your breakthrough isn't about God coming through all of that. It's you releasing yourself to God and saying, Lord, I didn't know any better. And even when I knew any better, I was under a force that I didn't know how to fight at the time. Now, some of y'all grew up uncovered. You grew up uncovered. You grew up uncovered. You came to church not because you chose Jesus. You deselected Satan. Mm -hmm. And some of us still got our track shoes on because the devil ran us to church. And now you fell in love with Jesus. But you grew up uncovered. Forgive yourself. Can we say this together? I forgive me. The second area, uh, era where the enemy comes at us very hard is since heaven smiled on you. Since heaven smiled on you. Since heaven smiled on you. And brothers and sisters, it's when you come into this place of awakening where you have been touched by God in a way where you start transacting business with God and you are now not just as a believer now you are walking into the next thing of God and you are praying for big things God has smiled on you he has changed your course and now you're praying big prayers and you're believing God for big things and then there is a delay and how the enemy talks to those who are new to the faith about delay, he tells you stuff like God didn't hear your prayers, you didn't pray long enough, God don't want to bless you, and he starts creating these delineations as though you are a stepchild of the kingdom and you don't quite got the relationship other Christians got, and then he starts depleting your faith over time and you quit praying and you quit seeking God because you're saying God don't like me like he likes them. Y'all remember the story of Daniel who was a man of great faith and integrity of a, 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 the greatest, some of the greatest integrity in the Bible. Well, there was a situation that came up in Daniel's life as a prophet and he started praying. This is what happened. The angel Gabriel comes to him and this is verse 12 in your handouts. It says the angel was talking Gabriel. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since when? The first day. That you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God. Your words were heard. Pause. When did God hear him? When does God hear you? Well, if he heard you the first day, then I'm inclined to deduce what's the problem with him answering years later. Okay, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. He says, we heard you the first day. God heard you the first day. And I have come in response to them. What is them? Prayers. God comes in response to what? Prayers. Not complaints. Not pity parties. Not tantrums. Oh, Lord. He comes in response to prayer. Verse 13, but... The prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me, Gabriel the angel. How many days? 21 days. 21 days. So pause. Let's break down verse 13. I'll get to verse uh, 13b in a second. So if Gabriel is an angel, then what could resist an angel? Certainly not a physical prince of the Persian kingdom. Okay. Right, right. 
Because an angel is powerful, according to scripture, than human beings. So it cannot be the prince of Persia. Then what is it, preacher? And how does he have power to resist Gabriel, which is the messenger angel, 21 days? Well, every territory has a spirit assigned to it called a principality. So what Gabriel was giving Daniel insight on, he says, you pray, but the spirit of that territory, the demon assigned to that area, resisted the angel Gabriel from bringing you this message. How long? 21 days. Can I tell y'all that every city has a principality? East St. Louis has a principality of poverty, of, 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 of things that are uncomely that wants to keep the city as it is. St. Louis has a principality. Okay, don't get y'all, don't knock, don't knock St. Louis. Houston has a principality. Atlanta has. It's a spirit, not of God, that wants to hold everything dysfunctional as normal. And the assignment of that principality is to fight any reformation. Belleville has a principality. Granite City has a principality. Shiloh, O'Fallon. What I'm trying to tell you, you can't run. Wherever you go, you've got to engage the principality. All right, let's go back to the text because y'all are really making me work. It says, 21 days, what? Let's look, next one. Then, then who? Then Michael, y'all are with me, y'all are, boy, that hooked on phonics worked. (laughs) Then Michael, keep reading with me, one of the chief princes came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now y'all catch that? Uh, Then Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. Chief princes is key because this is an empowered angel. Then it says the, 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 the chief prince or Michael, a chief prince, he's the angel of war in heaven. All right, so here you go. Gabriel is coming down to Daniel but is resisted right about here because the principality, which is the spirit of Persia, does not want Daniel to get a download from heaven. God releases Michael to come down who has more power than the principality. So I'm just trying to get y'all to understand what has been happening to your prayers is that you have been under atmospheric interference. God been trying to answer you. But atmospheric resistance has been the thing. Why? Because the enemy don't want you to get what God has for you. And so my brothers and sisters, how do you overcome what's in the atmosphere? Notice the Bible says God wasn't slack concerning his ability to help Daniel get to Daniel, or rather Gabriel get to Daniel. So God sent help to the help. And that ought to be your prayer for the next 21 days. Send help to my help. Can, can we just say that together? Can we say that together? Send help to my help. Can I get a handheld mic in a few minutes if that's okay? If you can help me out. I, I, I need one. So if you could help me out. Could you, thank you, sir. Uh, can we say that one more time? Send help, Send help. To, my help. to my help. Thank you, sir. Uh, y'all got to tune me in to the other channels, okay? Y'all got me? Okay, there we go. All right, I just want to make sure I don't lose my voice when I get done, okay? Um, thank you so much. If you can give me a little more monitor. All right, there you go. Thank you so much, dear. Send help. Send help. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm here to tell some of you all who are here on this wonderful day and those who are online that God wants you to begin to meditate on what's above you and not what's around you. 
There is some atmosphere resistance stopping what God had already bestowed and planned for you. That, listen, your business is about to prosper when you start praying the right path. When your, your health is about to turn around for good. But you got to start saying, God, whatever you got for me, I want it all. So here is, here is the response you need to have is embrace patience and trust the process. God has not forgotten you. God has not skipped over you. I need you to embrace the concept of patience, and I need you to trust the process. God is about to blow your mind. You don't believe me, do you? Okay, let's go back for a few seconds. All the hell you've been through in 23. All the setback, betrayal, all the painful moments, all the loss, all the hurt, all the hearsay that you had to endure. God is about to blow your mind. And how is it going to happen? He's going to send help to your help. Someone give God a praise right about there. I'm gonna move quickly. I gotta get you out of brunch. I gotta move quickly. The third era, the third era is since the kingdom birthed you. Now I'm talking about your second birth. The first one was your physical birth as a person. Now your spiritual birth. Ever since you said yes to Jesus. Boyfriends don't act right no more. Girlfriends after your dental insurance now. <laughs> We're trying to get a set of veneers off of you. I'm telling the truth. I mean truth. <laughs> since you decided to give your all to Jesus the enemy has been trying to deform and dysfunctionalize your walk with God. Y'all remember the story of the birth of Jesus we know about him being in the manger we know about him um, uh, the angel speaking to Mary we know about um, that physical side of it the wise men came to visit Jesus we also know that, that Herod wanted the wise men to indicate where Jesus was so that he can ultimately kill Jesus. And we know that Herod uh, passed an edict. All the children under two years old born at that time would be killed because he was afraid that Jesus or the Messiah being born would underthrow or overthrow and undermine his uh, governmental position. Well, we see that in the physical, but there was a whole spiritual element that was going, in, going on behind the scenes. In Revelation, the 12th chapter, it's actually filled with this, and I'm only giving you a snippet of it. But in Revelation, the 12th chapter, it gives you a snippet of what was going on in the spirit realm. It says, the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. I just gave you an Easter message right there, that last sentence. Okay. Notice the text. Shares with us that the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to do what? So that it might devour her child. When? From the moment it was born. See, the enemy is notified here as the dragon. While Jesus is going from uh, 
of Bethlehem and running to Egypt. And while Herod is passing this decree to kill all the kids under two, there's a whole spiritual war in the heavenlies that's going on. But God has an answer. Even in the warfare, the Bible says, and God snatched him up. Woo! I'm so glad to God that it, when it looks like the enemy has gotten the best of us, God has the ability to get us out. He has a rescue plan. He has a redemption plan. Can I say something else? He has a resurrection plan. For every dead dream. For every entombed purpose. God's about to call your name. He's about to call you from rigor mortis. Hallelujah, God. To being lively stones. Which tells me then the enemy is after your birth in Christ, which is why it seemed like people who you used to hang with are giving you a hard time for your conversion, your change, your new appetite. They're like, you don't do that no more. You kind of lame now. You kind of weak now. You can, I can't vibe with you now. And they use you language. They say stuff like, your energy ain't the same no more. Baby, who I look like? Amrin? <laughs> All this energy talk, won't you hook your energy up to my house so I can get some free electricity? <laughs> energy. The enemy opposes us today and he hits us from our birth in Christ. Which leads me as I close out, I'm past time. I'm so sorry. But I'll give you this and we'll go home. There are tools that we need to identify the enemy. Again, this is foundational. The enemy will always offer you more than he can deliver. The enemy will make a stolen car look real good. Jesus was promised the kingdoms of the world. Remember when he was in the wilderness tempted of the devil for 40 days. It says in Matthew 4 and 8 that again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. All this the devil is talking here. I will give you, he said, if you will fall down and worship me. I find it interesting that the devil had no kingdoms to give. How are you going to have the one that is the word made flesh that created everything by his word? How are you going to give something to somebody that created it all? The devil always offers more than he can deliver. The Bible says in John 8 and 44, for he is a liar. And the father, anytime you see in the Bible, the father of something, it means they are the experts. They have a doctorate degree plus a master's on top of the doctorate, plus another 10 years of study, plus a few published uh, articles on it, plus they are the expert at it. They have the expertise of it. And the Bible says that God is the father of mercy. Yeah. Ain't nobody gonna redeem you like God. <laughs> God can see you in your mess and forgive you because he's the father of mercy. God can see you in rebellion and restore you because he's the father of mercy. God can see you doing stupid stuff and restore you because he's the father of mercy. Now back to the devil. He's the father of lies. He'll tell you some sweet lies. Tell me lies. Tell me sweet little lies. Have y'all ever been next to a liar? I'm just saying next to, I ain't gonna add no other conditions to it, relationship, nothing. But have y'all noticed a liar can just lie? I mean, it's fluid. It's second nature. It's, it's a gift. They gift it. And they do it so convincingly. I'm going to leave it there. Valentine's Day is coming up. Just... 
Just watch the lies. The enemy offers more than he can deliver. That's how we can identify him. He's going to pump you up. And sometimes, we oftentimes think that means he, us rebelling against God. Can I tell you all, the enemy oftentimes uses your ego and the thoughts of grandiosity to make you believe that he can give you all of this if you do it that way. That's what he does. Another tool to identify the enemy is he's the author of disruption. He, all, he, he whispers and never, the devil has turned more kingdoms upside down by whispering than yelling. Yeah, yeah. He whispers. He never yells. In 1 Corinthians 14 and 33, as I prepare to close, and I'm closing, but God is not the author of So then implied, if God is not the author of confusion, who is? So the evil one is the author of confusion. Because his job is to somehow create confusion where there is the glory of God. He, he never wants the people of God to dwell in the place of peace because wherever peace is, there's prosperity. So he comes to disrupt peace where there is prosperity because his job is to get you out of focus. Don't y'all hate when your friends take pictures of you? And it be with you making the craziest looks. It be out of focus. Right? Head cut off. You ask them before you get out of your nice pose, you be like, did you get it? Knowing them heels about to wear you out. Ankle about to break. And you get your phone and you settle down and you look at the pictures and they all like, y'all out of focus. Can I be honest with y'all? The enemy started on me in July of last year on focus. I had more levied at me that I had nothing to do with since July get me out of focus. But you know, I appreciate God because I was one, able to recognize it. But the only reason I was able to recognize it was because I had been victimized by it. Seasons ago. I now understand what David meant, that it was good for me that I was afflicted. a retake test that they don't change the questions on. Because I might have messed up the first time, but baby, I'm passing with straight A's on the second go round. Tell your neighbor I'm bouncing back better than before. I've been knocking stuff down. Because whatever you focus on, you find. And if I focus on riffraff, I'm a fine riffraff. But if I focus on what I've been praying since the first day I set my mind to pray, I'm getting what God said is mine. Last one, last one. I could keep riding that out, but I, I want to appreciate and honor your time. Here's the deal, here's the deal. The last way we identify the enemy, he's an amazing litigator. You thought Johnny Cochran was bad. You thought the Trump's team that he has, a cashier of lawyers, $40 million later, were bad. Enemy is an amazing litigator. 
The Bible says that he accuses the brothers, which is reference, brothers is reference to the family of God. He accused them before our God when? You can identify the enemy by his offering more than he can deliver, by his disruption everywhere he goes, and by his accusation of the brotherhood. Could we stand all over the house? Well, next week, we're going to talk through three dimensions of attack. My prayer is that you have been helped, blessed. Prayer counselors, would you come forward? I got to do this because I believe there's a release in the house. For those of you who are new to us, these prayer counselors are here to pray with you. We're not asking you to join our church. My prayer is simple for those of you who are here today. Some of you all have been experiencing spiritual warfare. You have had some resistance above you that you couldn't quite put your hand on, finger on. You didn't know what was going on. And my hope today is that you would be honest about what has been the blockade, the delay, causing you all kinds of hopelessness, causing you all kinds of feelings of isolation. Some of you all are new to this area and you have been feeling lonelier than you've ever felt before and there has been a battle of promise and purpose. And you can't quite put two wins together. You don't know why a win on January doesn't equate to a win in February. You like a win in January, then there's a win in December and you are depleted in between those times. And you have been fighting this warfare of your child and of your family. There has been some interference those in overflow, those who are here today in the balcony, I'm going to offer you the opportunity to come to this altar and talk to one of these prayer counselors to get prayer. I am not going to, I'm not going to overemphasize this, but if you know for a fact that you need your help to get help, and you're in the battle of your life, in the fight of your life, I'm going to invite you to come from your aisle, come up here and get prayer. As these wonderful people come forward, can you just give God a hand for them? We won't embarrass you. We won't put you out. We're just going to pray for you, man. If you want to give your life to the Lord, knowing good and well, you have kind of weighed, swayed away, they will help you with that. And if y'all would give us five minutes to pray for these wonderful souls, I promise you, you will be blessed in the end. My brothers and sisters, you've just heard a word and your heart might be prompted to say, what must I do to be a part of the kingdom of God? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's quite simple. The Bible says in Romans 10 and 10 that if we would confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we would be saved. Yes, coming into relationship with Jesus as Savior is just that simple. So I want you to repeat after me, and then I want you to consider what the next steps are. So say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that God raised you from the grave for the remission of my sins. I thank you and ask that you come into my heart, fill me with the Holy Spirit, and we thank you for making me a child of God. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. All of heaven is throwing a party because of you. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your generosity. This is an opportunity that I don't take for granted. I want to let you know that every donation goes towards expanding the kingdom, providing hope to communities, bringing families together, and helping people set the course towards purpose. Your generosity makes all of that happen. So I encourage you and thank you at the same time. Now here are some instructions, some housekeeping items as a part of Living the Word Church. We need to make certain that in order for us to allocate resources properly, especially assign those resources to your name, that when you're giving via Cash App, that you put your full name in the memo line. We definitely understand the actual handles can be different and quirky and all kinds of names, but in order for us to allocate those resources to your name, just in the memo, put your full name in the memo. In addition, when you're giving via check or if you're filling out an envelope, it is essential that you fill out all of the details so we can properly allocate those resources to your household. Let's go deeper and let's trust that God has even more as we sow today. Thank you.